Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us on the AAA online briefing series for our uh, Global Tech webinar series. My name is Ron Gorsi, I'm the CEO, CEO of the AAA and we're delighted to have you joining us today uh, in what has been a terrific series as we look at all the opportunities around the region and we're proud to uh, uh, be able to present this uh, with uh, with Austrade as well. A couple of housekeeping matters first and foremost is due to the uh, sheer number of uh, people there are on the call, only the presenters and the panellists are visible and audible. Uh, so uh, that is why you are unable to uh, to participate for, with, uh, with your audio. But if you would like to ask questions, we will have a Slido um, uh, link for you to use, and we want you to use that for your questions so that the panel discussion uh, will come through. That'll, that'll come up in a moment. But first, it, may I uh, pay my respects uh, to, and acknowledge to all the traditional custodians of uh, all of the lands we meet on around Australia. Uh, for me, it's the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I recognise their continued connection to land, waters and culture, and I pay my respect to Elders past, present and emerging, and indeed all First Nations people who are on the call today. Uh, our um, host today from Austrade is uh, David Camalingo, and I'll hand over to him and then we'll start proceedings. Uh, but as I say, with the uh, Slido, that uh, if you can just pull up that slide, please, Marnie, uh, all your questions should go to uh, the slido.com and you can either uh, scan your QR code or uh, take the information from that slide. But uh, enough from me, we have plenty of speakers and uh, we have an hour to get through. So David, over to you. Thank you for, very much for your support for this series. Yes, thank you, Ron, and welcome everybody. And uh, look, it's a pleasure to be here. I think, I can't remember, I'm losing count. I think this might be the sixth installment of this series, um, of this Global Tech webinar series, uh, where we're very pleased to be partnering with AAA, the Australian Information Industry Association, to really start to profile um, the, 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 I guess, the opportunity for Australian technology companies and start to profile the digital agenda uh, across uh, across the planet, across the globe. And um, today we're very pleased to be able to profile the Philippines market. Uh, lots happening in terms of the digital adoption that's happening across the consumer level, as well as um, some of the digital transformation that's happening right across, uh, across the economy. So very excited. We've got an incredible panel of speakers and I'd like to thank um, Christopher Lim and team at the Austrade's post in Manila for helping to coordinate uh, this great session today. I'll just um, also flag that this webinar is, is actually recorded and will be this. There's always such incredible content that's shared throughout um, these webinars uh, and presentations that it's hard to capture all of it in um, in the one hour. However, we we'll typically put this information and this content up both on the AIIA website, but also on uh, Austrade's website. So we'll be able to share that information if you wanted to access it at any time afterwards. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to hand over to our Austrade and introduce Austrade's Senior Trade and Investment Commissioner for the Philippines, based out of Manila, um, Christopher Lim, to kick off the agenda. Christopher, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, David, and also to Ron, and welcome uh, everyone on the call. Uh, thank you for tuning in uh, for today's Global Tech webinar on the Philippines. So I'm Christopher Lim, the uh, Senior Trade and Investment Commissioner based in Manila. I've been in the Philippines for the past uh, year and a half, and I've witnessed a uh, tremendous uh, dynamism and energy of this market. So I'm very pleased that you can join us. This market actually offers so much potential for Australian businesses. The Philippines is in the midst of a digital revolution as economic and social systems have been radically transformed digitally. Its digitalization journey has been catapulted uh, by the pandemic, and prior to that, supported by 21 years of uh, consecutive uh, economic growth. The country's uh, internet economy is expected to grow by 30% annually to reach US $28 billion by 2025, and that's in three years' time, uh, according to Google Alphabeta. In January of last year, Filipinos aged 16 to 64 spent the highest average amount of 
time using the internet, you know, and that's a global scale. And the figures are quite amazing, like 10 hours a day. Uh, also, the number of digital buyers in the Philippines has the second highest growth rate in the Asia Pacific uh, behind Indonesia. So similar to developing countries in Asia, the pandemic has amplified the importance of digital transformation and has effectively pushed forward the uh, digital revolution by a number of years, providing an opportunity for Philippines to ride the next digital wave. So it is in this vein that we believe digital uh, enablement can be a powerful lever to address the unmet needs of the target segments in the Philippines. That said, the market also presents certain challenges that require you to establish relationships with key business groups, invest in knowing the intricacies of the Philippine consumer behavior, and for you to exercise patience and resilience. One of my clients uh, who have been very experienced in the Philippines emphasizes that the market is patient effort. We have a full session today and a great lineup of government and industry thought leaders who will share with us why you should be considering the Philippines. Each one of these extraordinary speakers will spend 10 minutes on their topic. Our first speaker is Undersecretary Rafaelita Aldaba from the Philippine Department of Trade and Industries Competitiveness Innovation Group, DTICIG. It is an honor to have Undersecretary Aldaba to join us today, given her busy schedule. The Undersecretary is a researcher turned policymaker. She led the formulation and implementation of the comprehensive national industrial strategy and the new policy uh, known as inclusive innovation industrial strategy. USEC Aldaba will provide us uh, uh, information about the important role the government plays, specifically her agency uh, in the digital uh, roadmap of the Philippines. Yusek Aldaba, a very warm welcome and over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Christopher. Okay, so, um, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Australian Embassy for giving us the opportunity to present the policy directions of the government to develop a vibrant tech ecosystem, accelerate digital transformation, and prepare our industries for the future of work and production. The government, as uh, you uh, correctly mentioned, uh, next slide, please. The government has an important role to play in building an enabling regulatory environment that would allow the development of a robust tech ecosystem. Important legislations that were enacted in more recent years, as you can see on the slide, would include the Data Privacy Act, Cybercrime Prevention Act, Philippine Innovation Act, Innovative Startup Act, Philippine National ID System, and the Public Service Act, which liberalized the telecommunications sector. The country has also made great strides in championing the crafting of plans and programs to promote the digital economy, such as the National Cybersecurity Plan, e-commerce roadmap, National Broadband Plan, Free Public Internet Access Program, Common Tower Policy, and the Digital Payments Transformation Roadmap. Next, please. Our industrial strategy is science, technology, and innovation driven with the ultimate goal of growing globally competitive and innovative industries. There are six strategic actions, namely embracing Industry 4.0, development of innovative MSMEs and startups, integration of our production systems, building the innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem, upskilling and reskilling the workforce, and enabling, creating an enabling economic environment. Next, please. In terms of priority industry clusters, we have identified the following. The first one is the industrial manufacturing and transport cluster, which would cover aerospace, automotive, and electric vehicles. And then we have the technology, media, and telecommunications cluster covering IT BPM, hyperscale data centers, the creative economy, and digital economy products using AI, robotics, 
and a lot more. And then the third, we have the Health and Life Sciences Cluster, which would include um, life sciences and biotech sector, pharmaceuticals, medical devices, healthcare services, digital health products and services, among others. And lastly, the resource-based industries, which would include industries based on green metals processing. We have a lot of nickel, cobalt, and copper resources, along with agriculture, agro-industrial activities, and renewable energy. Next, please. The Philippine startup ecosystem is composed of a young, energetic, tech-savvy population brimming with potential. The ecosystem currently has over 700 startups, um, over 35 incubators and accelerators, more than 50 angel investors, more than 200 co-working spaces, 40 plus venture capitalists, and uh, our valuation is around 2 billion US dollars. In terms of strengths, most startups are into fintech, e-commerce, and logistics. And currently we are implementing programs um, to promote uh, the development of our startups. And this would cover um, uh, support covering um, incubation and acceleration programs, such as the Startup Idea and Advance and the Global Acceleration Program. We also have a Startup Venture Fund, which to date has a total investable fund of 500 million um, pesos. Next, please. And consistent with uh, the strategic action to embrace Industry 4.0, we have developed a holistic program to provide end-to-end -end support to manufacturing firms in their digital transformation journey. As you can see on the slide, we are conducting Industry 4.0 workshops to capacitate manufacturing executives on um, fourth industrial revolution tools and concepts through the Smart Industry Readiness Index or CV, we are supporting companies in terms of the assessment of their readiness for digital transformation. And beyond assessments, we are also supporting the roadmap development activities of firms. Um, and then we are also planning to establish an Industry 4.0 pilot factory that will host demonstrations and simulations of Industry 4.0 case applications. And finally, as companies pursue digital transformation, we are offering fiscal incentives under the CREATE law. And this is the country's new fiscal incentive regime. We are also pursuing uh, the Philippine Skills Framework Program in order for us to address the jobs, skills mismatch, and also to ensure that the skills and competencies demanded by firms in the future would be sufficiently provided. And then we have the Center for AI Research. Um, this is the plan um, in order for us to equip industries with cutting edge technologies and solutions using artificial intelligence. Next, please. Well, just to elaborate, uh, the Philippine Skills Framework, this seeks to develop a common reference or language that employers, workers, and training institutions would share in order to ensure the match between jobs in the markets and the skills needed by the industries. The next one, um, this is on the Industry 4.0 Pilot Factory. This is going to host pilot demonstration and learning laboratories. It will serve as a technology platform for various uh, stakeholders. It will also serve as a training and research hub where industries can generate insights and have hands-on experience on various Industry 4.0 applications. And ultimately, it will facilitate industry access to advanced manufacturing technologies, such as robotics, intelligent manufacturing systems, and cyber-physical systems. Next, please. Uh, like what I've said, we're building the Center for AI uh, Research. Well, uh, there are over uh, 50 Filipino tech startups that are already using AI as a core technology. And according to EDBI and Kearney, AI adoption in the Philippines could contribute 92 billion US dollars to the Philippine economy by 2030. 
So the care, as we call it, is being established as a public-private partnership hub where data scientists and researchers can perform collaborative AI, R&D, and applications together with universities and research institutions. It's also going to offer consultancy services and AI tech products to support the digital transformation of MSMEs and large enterprises. Next, please. To diffuse innovation in all parts of the country, we are establishing regional inclusive innovation centers, which serve as the common platforms for various stakeholders to collaborate and advance innovation and entrepreneurship in the country's regions. Next, please. Our new incentive system, which is known as the Create or Corporate Recovery and Tax Incentives for Enterprises Act, has made the country's incentive system more modern and innovation driven. The highest level of incentives are being granted to activities that would bring in high tech projects along with R&D commercialization. Next, please. Digital technologies continue to change business models and people's lives. And with the pandemic, governments and societies were compelled to turn toward these technologies to respond to the crisis. And data, data show a significant growth recorded in the use of social media, e-commerce, streaming content, and video games between 2020 and 2021. And currently, there are 76 million internet users in the Philippines, an internet penetration rate of 68%. And there are also 156.5 million cellular mobile connections in the country. And in terms of uh, the e-commerce sector, the Economy Southeast Asia report highlighted the doubling of the Philippine internet economy to 17 billion US dollars in the first half of 2021. And this is expected to increase by 24% to reach 40 billion US dollars in 2025. Next, please. I think this is my last slide. Um, we have adopted the World Bank's Connect, Harness, Innovate, Protect, or CHIP framework as we accelerate our digital transformation. Through a whole of government and whole of society approach, we continue to address constraints affecting our efforts towards connecting the Filipino people and harnessing the opportunities arising from digital transformation. To boost digital penetration, we are focusing on increasing investments in connectivity, modernizing and expanding the digital infrastructure in the country, harnessing market opportunities offered by digital payments and online platforms, especially for MSMEs, reducing logistics costs by improving the efficiency of the country's logistics system and improving ease of doing business by creating an enabling business environment that would allow the digital economy to flourish. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Yusek Aldaba. Uh, clearly a very ambitious uh, whole of government and whole of Philippine uh, a mandate for the digitalization of the Philippine economy. And I'm uh, very um, delighted to hear about the Center for AI Research um, and also about regional inclusion as well. And I remember that, you know, all these aspects was highlighted by the president of the Philippines during his State of the Nation address in July. Now, and the other uh, aspect is uh, Yusek Aldaba. I'm very, very personally glad to see the women are represented in the tech and digital industry here in, in the Philippines. Um, to introduce uh, my second speaker uh, is a great pleasure because now that we've heard uh, from the government, we turn to the uh, private sector to obtain uh, their perspective. Uh, uh, Mr. Randall Antonio will answer the question of how technology is changing the economic and social landscape in the Philippines. Mr. Antonio is the consulting principal under the business transformation and innovation domain of SGV or Ernst & Young Philippines. 
Randall has 25 years of international C-level experience and in driving and implementing digital transformation, disruptive technologies, applied automation, and quality management systems. Randall, a warm welcome, and it's my pleasure to give you the floor. Thank you, Chris. Thank you to Austrade. Um, welcome and good afternoon to everybody. Thank you for listening to, to this session of the program. My name again is Randall Antonio. I'm a partner for SGV, which is EY Philippines. And allow me to share with you my screen. <clears throat> okay. So today I will be talking about how technology is changing the economic and social landscape in the Philippines. But before anything else, what I'd like to uh, do is Randall, provide you a contact. Randall, you may need to uh, just go to display settings and switch your screen. Okay, sorry. Now go back to where you were and then in display settings, just swap the screen. Yeah. Is this um, visible at now? The, at the top where it says display settings. That's it. If you click on that. Display settings. At the top. To your okay. left. If you click on display settings, it'll ask you to swap the screen over to yeah. presentation mode. Bear with me. Apologies for that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, before anything else, I'd like to provide you a context of um, SGV and EY. We are EY Philippines, uh, the largest uh, accounting firm in the Philippines at the moment, uh, uh, providing service to many of the local Philippine conglomerates and uh, other companies. <clears throat> so what I'd like to talk about today is how tremendous the effect of technology has put on the world we live today. So in general, globally, uh, we have um, seen how quality of human life has improved. We've gained so much information access. We're able to communicate in different ways. Our productivity has increased significantly as well. And a lot of these things have contributed to as a catalyst for further innovation. However, on the downside, uh, there has been reports of isolation. Uh, people have been disconnected uh, socially, uh, physically. There's a risk of obsolescence where a lot of technologies are overcoming a lot of other recently developed technologies and has created limited opportunities for uh, many businesses and many individuals as well. So to put things in context for the Philippines, uh, for those who have not uh, been to the Philippines yet, the Philippines is made up of 7,000 641 islands, and we have a population of about 112 million. 12.8 million, or about 10% of that, is in Metro Manila, which is made up of 17 cities and municipalities. And in the outskirts of Greater Manila, there's about a total of 22.7 collectively. There's about 368 people per square kilometer and 47.5% of urban dwellers. But if you look at the age in the Philippines, the median is about 25.7 years, which puts the Philippines at a very interesting situation. 72% of the Filipinos have access to the internet, as Chris has mentioned. Uh, each of them spend about 10 hours a day on average. And about 97.2% of that 72% are accessed via mobile phones. Internet growth has uh, grown around 2.8% year on year, and most of our graduates are employable, and most of 
coming from the top 50 colleges out of the country. And um, interestingly as well, 12.5% of this population believe that education and skills are out of date. So what drives technology advancement in the Philippines? That's an interesting question. Significant growth in private and public investment has fueled a lot of this in the recent years. A lot of uh, multinational companies have come and entered into the Philippines and spurred a growth in technology development. They've invested in a lot of other activities or um, factories that, that promoted the Philippine capability when it comes to people and, and processes, which led to the re remarkable economic and job expansion, which is about 4.6% year on year. Consequently, that also increased the middle class significantly, which also increased the consumer spending and the demand for better service. When you look at these things in, in, in the right perspective, uh, these are driven by mainly the government because the government has initiated what we call Public Service Act 11659, where foreign companies are now allowed to own 100% of public services in the Philippines. The government has also enabled the Doing Business and Efficient Service Delivery Act, or RA11032, which, which significantly cuts the red tape and all the other requirements to enter the Philippines as a business. And most importantly, the Department of Information and Communications and Technology, RA10844 in 2016, was established to promote technology and transformation initiatives for the private and public sector. So all in all, this has impacted a lot of avenues, uh, mainly in communication. People are able to communicate anytime, anywhere. They're able to use their mobile phones, computer systems, through the internet. And this has developed into something like a phenomenon where the Philippines is now the number one text and uh, messaging capital of the world. In terms of access, we do have the ability to gather and gain information, goods and services through the internet and through the technology enabled devices. Social media has opened up a lot of entertainment possibilities and has changed the view of the world of the Filipinos. We can now go and look at uh, information about certain things anywhere where they are in the world. And the entertainment sector has also evolved significantly by streaming services and all these other um, platforms that we now have available. How we shop has also been impacted uh, in a positive manner, fintech, uh, mainly banking, um, consumer goods, travel, et cetera. Education has played a significant role as well uh, on how we learn. Uh, technology has implemented a, a way for us to learn remotely, which also increased the reach of education for all the less privileged areas we have in country. For businesses, there's a lot of transformation initiatives happening. There's a lot of companies now transforming, digitizing, digitalizing, and, and um, doing a lot of activities that, that um, would make them relevant and significant in the years to come. We also have seen a lot of new startups. Entrepreneurship is, an all, is at an all-time high. Uh, you've seen a lot of these companies come out with very good ideas, which are very disruptive, which are very innovative. And so uh, there's a lot of these things now in the Philippines as we see fit. A lot of gig economy has also spurred new opportunities for the traditional and non-traditional channels. You've seen a lot of um, acquisitions and, and uh, new ideas come out in this segment of the market, which generate further innovation. Uh, new ideas are being created as you integrate technology with one another, evolving technology, that, that um, place on top of each other, uh, creates new opportunities and innovations as well. All in all, it disrupts, it changes the way people think, it changes the way businesses operate, and it changes the way we behave socially. A lot of portal and platforms has now surfaced as well um, for efficiency. Uh, you are now able to go into government websites to, to apply for almost anything that, that uh, used to take time away from you to travel to the government office and, and, and do all of that. And, and that also applies to other public and private um, organizations. 
which now also brings us to the other component, which allows the Philippines to reach a global market, which makes our country a borderless state. We are now able to, to provide services by using the internet as a channel to, to reach other countries and, and um, also secure products and services from them. So in conclusion, the Philippines is a great destination for multinational companies. Basically, the wages of the employees have increased, the products prices have declined. There's an increase for technological advancement in country. There's a lot of modernization of equipment and technology that you will see with a lot of the companies in the Philippines. Jobs and people are more intellectual and are created. Um, there's more progressive and modern personnel that you will encounter in the Philippines. A lot of ideas and creativity emerge as well. And there's a lot of push from the government for technology transfer and make the Philippines as a trading hotbed. All in all, the Philippines is a great investment destination. That's the end of my slide. Back to you, Chris. Thank you very much, um, Randall. I, that, that's absolutely fascinating. And you've uh, put it very logically how, you know, why it is that the Philippines uh, is actually on its uh, transformation, you know, journey. And I can see it for myself uh, when I'm here. Um, and the unprecedented sort of growth and uptake in the use of fintech and e-commerce logistics uh, is, is very, very plain for me to see. And, and I can see also, you know, very much the, the young and digitally savvy population here. Uh, and this is actually one of the Philippines, you know, greatest assets. Now, for our third speaker, uh, also from the uh, private sector, is uh, um, Anthony uh, Ujian, the Managing Director and Senior Partner in the Boston uh, Consultancy Group. He will also go into why you should be considering the Philippines uh, and go down deeper into the sectors of opportunities. Anthony is a seasoned advisor with years of practice in Southeast Asia. He has extensive experience in e-payments, digital businesses, and digital transformations. And as a non-Filipino, he can give an outsider's view on the tremendous transformation taking place in the Philippines. Anthony is one of the most sought after speakers in the Philippines tech scene. And so we are very grateful to have him speak to us today. Over to you, Anthony. Bonjour. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for having me at this event. It's always great to share or passion about the Philippines and about the dynamic of this market. And uh, clearly a lot has been happening in the last few years. Uh, many people perceive the Philippines as maybe the lagar in the region. Uh, and I think it's clearly not the case. Um, it's a market you will see that has a very high potential and that is starting to, to realize this potential. And today I will focus mostly on what we call the digital revolution, but mostly the, the, the appearance of a vibrant startup scene. And, 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 then, and then Jojo later will illustrate the kind of things we see happening in this market and how exciting it is uh, for, for the country and for investors. Um, maybe just a few facts. I think some were mentioned, but the Philippines, besides being like the second largest market uh, in Southeast Asia, is also one of the fastest growing, and we expect the GDP growth to, to rebound north of 8% and being among the fastest economy. It's also one of the youngest population with an average age, uh, you know, quite younger than Indonesia, for example, with only 24 and a half years old. It's also a very well-educated market, and as it was mentioned from one of the presenters, it's a market where people are passionately digital. Uh, we do a lot of consumer uh, ethnographics at BCG in the Philippines. And, and very constantly, we realize how actually savvy are all the segments of the population when it comes to digital engagement. Uh, it started as being one of the leading Facebook nation, but it's also a nation that is well advanced in many other usage, including digital payment now. Um, the hit from the pandemic was quite severe. We had one of the strictest lockdown and longest lockdown in the region, but the rebound has been quite strong. Uh, many of the industries are back uh, or close to pre-pandemic levels, and that has fueled a lot of the, the, the growth that I was mentioning before. Fundamentally, the, 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 
the fundamentals of this economy are healthy, and therefore it's quite normal to go back to this. We've of course the kind of challenge we see in other markets as well around inflation, around supply chain uh, um, disruption. But fundamentally, it's a market that is poised to rebound and continue its trajectory. Um, the, the previous administration uh, has been quite supportive and created a set of policies that were considered at least largely uh, investor friendly, uh, be it regarding the ease of doing business, uh, some simplification, uh, red tape cutting, uh, in the, they, they, they launch uh, uh, new digital banking licenses, they support the, the build program that includes, of course, the, the digital assets. Um, and also they re release a set of restrictions. And all these conditions have been quite favorable in stimulating the environment. And you, you will see that digital banks, for example, are, are shaking, shaking the market for, for, for the good. Um, for those of you who will be familiar with Indonesia, Indonesia has witnessed a boom in the early 20s, uh, early 10, sorry. And I was lucky at the time to work a lot in uh, Indonesia and to witness the activation and then the growth of a very vibrant tech team. Uh, it started around 2010 with a few investments, 2009, 2010, uh, with the creation of Tokopedia, Gojek that were supported initially by a few funds. But then the ecosystem grew to create now I think four or five uh, unicorns and a very vibrant support system of VCs and, and, and funds and the larger funds. And, and this has grew into a time, almost a time, 10 billion uh, investment market uh, by 2021. And Philippines was really, really behind. If you look at 2013, uh, <laughs> Indonesia was almost uh, 100 times the size of the Philippines. And really, the, the market was not ignited. But I think it really changed uh, the last two, three years. And now the market witnessed last year more transaction volume than in the previous four or five years. And we see the set of emerging players, uh, you know, Grocery, Kumu, uh, and a few others like Great Deal will be already in the multi-millions, uh, but there are many more to come. And I think then there is also an ecosystem of players, and I think uh, JGDev is one of them, but there is also Foxmont, Gentry, that have been also supporting this ecosystem. Um, this is again the parallel with, with, the, with Indonesia. It took 10 years to Indonesia to get where it is today. It may take less actually for the Philippines because of the catch up effect to get to a similar kind of environment. Uh, all the ingredients are there, the money, the talents, the ideas. Um, and while we are still probably behind, there is still a lot of growth to, to be expected in the, in, the, in the next few years. I mentioned a few deals. So a lot of companies are still series B, series C, so getting to the, you know, 100 million or getting to the few hundred millions, um, not yet a proper um, unicorn, but this is to be expected within years. And as I mentioned, you can see it, uh, the volumes of uh, investment that we witnessed last year was close to a billion dollars, if you take the full year, and we're probably on track to, to do something similar this year. Um, and the kind of player we've seen initially, there were early uh, players like Foxmont Capital, one of the first venture uh, funds in the Philippines, uh, and Kickstart, who was not really focused in the Philippines. But in the last few years, we've seen the emergence of very meaningful funds uh, backed by conglomerates. Uh, we've seen the emergence of new uh, pure play funds uh, and venture builders like Kaya. Uh, and now we see increasingly uh, the regional and even the global funds. So when the country reopened in March. Uh, we've seen all sorts of VCs flowing to the countries and checking and meeting the entrepreneurs. Uh, and if you look at the kind of deal and the kind of player that are backing the recent deal, it's also the world class, class firms like KKR, Surge, uh, Warburg, uh, and many others who are not looking into taking a foot into the market. Um, if you want to know more, uh, there is a report that we published with uh, Foxmont, so you can uh, download it by uh, scanning the QR code, but happy to take more questions on the topic uh, later uh, in, the, in, the, in the sharing today. Over to you, Christ Christopher. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anthony. And uh, those are amazing slides. And it's so good to see that, you know, the trajectory uh, for the Philippines uh, is very good. And if you if you take uh, Indonesia as, as a basis or, you know, of course, you know, the journey will be different. Uh, but, you know, the prognosis is very good. And also also so interesting to hear your views about how an ecosystem is actually uh, forming. So thank you for that, Anthony. Now, for my fourth speaker, uh, it's our last, but definitely not the least, because uh, it is uh, Jojo Malalos Bololos, uh, from JG uh, um, Digital Equity Ventures, uh, one of the most exciting um, companies you know, coming out of this revolution, which uh, Anthony has mentioned. So um, Jojo Malolos is the Chief Executive Officer of uh, JG Digital Equity Ventures or JGDEV and the CEO of uh, Data Analytics Venture uh, Inc, DAVI. So Jojo is a senior leader uh, from one of the Philippines largest and diversified conglomerate, the uh, JG Summit of the Gokongwe family. Jojo is a fam familiar face in the fintech scene in Southeast Asia, and he was formerly the CEO of Wing, a pioneering mobile finance institution in Cambodia. He has since uh, made a comeback to the Philippines to lead GoTime, a digital bank uh, joint venture uh, of the Gokongwe and Time Digital Bank of South Africa. Now over to you, Jojo. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chris. And uh, you know, it's a privilege and very thankful for the opportunity to share our story with everybody, uh, particularly showcasing the Philippines' uh, story about impactful uh, digitalization. And so thank you for the organizers. And uh, it is also such a, such a privilege for me to be here speaking with a panel of esteemed uh, co-speakers in Undersecretary Aldaba, Mr. Antonio, of course, my co-journeyman in the digitization of industries in the Philippines, uh, Anthony uh, Winjan. As the last uh, leg of the presentations, it, quite, it is quite noteworthy that this presentation grounds uh, the essence of digitization mo momentum that had set the pace in the Philippines. The case with the Gokongwe Group will give everybody here uh, an appreciation of the impact of digital revolution in the country. Some call it um, digital economy, but, through the, and, but this one is through the lens of one of the biggest conglomerates in the country. Sustaining this momentum in the Gokongwe Group ecosystem will unveil corporate efforts not only to support and go with the di digitalization flow in the country, but to create a unique impetus on digitization that will allow for eventual achievement of having positive impact on industries and ultimate, ultimately to, to uh, the society for sustainable and progressive growth. So the Gokongwe Group, for those who still don't know, is one of the largest conglomerates in the country Staple brands such as Cebu Pacific, Jack and Jill of the Universal Rubina Corporation, our Robinson Supermarkets, malls, properties, Summit Media. In its annual report in, uh, in, annual report in 2021, the JG Summit reaffirmed its quest towards massive digital transformation. And one of the CEOs have said, the only way we can prove that we are really transforming digitally is when we see ourselves having significant economic impact on the landscapes in which we play. Indeed, the conglomerate had. URC for uh, its part had consistently performed well contributing more than about $2 billion in revenues, achieving about a half a billion in net income. Cebu Pacific, despite the pandemic challenges, continues to sustain viability with about half a billion in revenues, but still expected now that uh, uh, COVID is, is almost gone uh, to grow this 2022. Our retail business, uh, Robinson's Retail Holdings, is also continuously leading the industry with about $3 billion in revenues in 2021. This performance reflects the inherent passion of the group to continuously adopt and innovate to maintain competitive advantages. From its establishment in the late 1950s, the group had proceeded from establishment to growth, to transformation, and now harping on its ability to manage disruption in this age. The creation of new builds, uh, Davi and JG Dev, um, in 2018, was also an offshoot of the major leadership transition from Mr. John Gokongwe 
Jr. to his son, Lance Gokongwe. Davi was formed, or Data Analytics Ventures Inc. was formed to harness the rewards programs of Robinson's Retail with the rewards program of Cebu Pacific, leveraging on the power of loyal customers to the Gokongwe brands in sustaining, driving, transforming, and disrupting its footprints. We sustain and fuel this cycle with managing a homegrown data analytics platform that aims to leverage on the power of data, driven data-driven decisions in each of the company in the conglomerate to execute strategies and achieve objectives. JG Digital Equity Ventures, or JG Dev, on the other hand, was also established around that time and was meant to be another platform by which this sustain, drive, transform, and disrupt cycle can be harnessed by being the gateway between technologies and talented entrepreneurs who will both drive digitization in the conglomerate and benefit from the ecosystem themselves. So JG Dev is a corporate venture capital that invests in early stage companies. Going to the specifics, uh, the digital transformation transforming capability of DABI rests on the data analytics platform that we have built to generate never before seen insights through AI and machine learning using billions of data points in our rewards program data, which counts about 6 million regular customers. The loyalty data is the lifeblood of our analytics. And we use this to develop algorithms, AI instances to create new personas, reflective buyer behavior that can be analyzed to provide predictive and prescriptive capability that will influence brand decisions for revenue growth, product adoption. Most notable metrics here are the return on advertising spends or ROAS, conversion rates of customers adopting or switching to brand products. In essence, what we have discovered are shifts in behavior of customer that define the new normal. Customers have become more health conscious, omnichannel shopping opportunities exist, and there's a clamor for more personalized experience. All this behavior is captured in the platform that allowed Dabi to provide new possibilities and probabilities for customer success for brands. The insights to allow the brands to customize promotions for different shoppers, including non-category shoppers with high propensity to purchase. Conversion rates average 6.3% compared to standard industry range of about one to 3%. A conversion in some products actually hit a high of 28.4%, owing to the predictive nature of our AIE-driven analytics. Dabi's business intelligence in the platform also enables retail businesses to personalize shopping experience and empowers brands to make strategic bets in growing their businesses. We have monetized these models and have been a good, good source of alternate, alternative advertising spend or consumer reports for brands to take on uniquely during these times. Going to JG Dev, as mentioned earlier, we are a corporate venture capital company and uh, being uh, our, our, sole, our, our sole funder is the Gokongwe group of companies. It's a CVC that invests in early stage startups with high growth potential and which can also harness and sustain the digital transformation of the group and its ecosystem. We the risk our bets on these startups by using their innovation to improve the group company's business models around e-commerce, fintech, logistics, and supply chains. And we are now getting into health tech also and general, or general product innovations. The biggest part of our investment thesis really is that of uh, seeing whether the innovation works. And we see use our ecosystem as a sandbox for the innovation to be stress tested so it launches successfully. So as a first example of our portfolio, uh, I'm going to cite three examples here. The first one is Grocery. You've seen uh, Grocery in the slides of Anthony earlier and also in uh, um, the, the, the uh, slides of, uh, of DTI. Um, we invested in Grocery, a B2B e-commerce platform that aims to enable the big part of the Philippines Sari Sari store footprint to be more successful, more profitable, and be at the core of strategies of FMCGs and distribution companies. Initially, we use our retail supermarket, our hardware and drugstore ecosystem to be connected to the Sari Sari stores. And we used, uh, we used Grow Sari to be in the middle of enabling that. So right now, we have enabled about 100,000 uh, Sari Sari stores, which are all managed by Grow Sari and its innovation in bringing products to the stores electronically and efficiently to allow for more margins for the Sari Sari store owners. Grow Sari is now one of the more successful startups in the country 
as they endeavor to enable hundreds and of thousands of more hundreds and thousands of uh, sari sari stores to be resilient and profitable. The second example is a company called Darwin Box, one of the leading HR platforms in the region. The Gokongwei Group right, prides itself of being one of the recipients of this digital and app-based HR process efficiency benefits by using Darwin Box itself. As we have used Darwin Box, we are very confident that our investment in, um, in Darwin Box will be uh, a big, big and good bet. So it, right now it has grown 300% in the Philippines since we invested in early 2021. We are also fortunate to have Darwin Box in our portfolio and Darwin Box had just turned to become a unicorn early this year. So uh, we, are, we are very, very proud to have uh, uh, been part of Darwin Box uh, journey towards being a unicorn. Last example is uh, GoTime or Time Global. You will, you will hear probably in the Philippines, uh, this hashtag, it's GoTime. Uh, the GoHomeway Group in a venture with Time of South Africa is set to launch GoTime Go Bank this quarter. We just recently received certificate of authority to operate as a digital bank a privilege given to only about six companies in the country. We are the fourth to launch this uh, uh, quarter. GoTime is a product for investment in time initially in 2021, and we strategically brought them to the Philippines to set up a joint venture to operate the digital banks, which, we are, we will, which as I said, we'll be launching uh, this year. Time for its part has successfully operated in a dig its digital bank in South Africa, now covering about 5 million customers acquired in only 36 months of operations. GoTime intends to replicate this in the Philippines with the same strategy of embedding banking in shopping and, and business experiences of its customers. And how convenient it is for GoTime to do this with the consumer, retail, and business landscapes of the, Royal, uh, of the Go Home Week. My last slide to conclude is that, uh, you know, this experience and what we have just showcased in the Go Home Week group provides everybody an opportunity to take a view of how successful, how successes in the conglomerates businesses uh, digitization can make. The successful business case, I think, should, can be shared globally to harness success of startups while ensuring significant improvements in the business environment of different economies. For Australia, uh, I think, and for other countries, we have several opportunities of collaboration from insight sharing to technology exposure on startup innovations to sandboxing of ESG opportunities in the group for sustainability organizations in Australia or in the region. That ends my presentation. Thank you for listening and back to you, Chris. Thank you very much, uh, Jojo. Some very exciting ventures you know, coming up uh, and uh, terrific. Also, also, congratulations that uh, Darwin Box has become uh, you know, uh, the uh, unicorn here in, in the Philippines. Now this uh, ends uh, the presentations. We have uh, some time for uh, questions and answers. So may I ask everyone, uh, the panelists to actually put your video on. Uh, and um, the first question uh, is uh, for um, the undersecretary. Uh, and it's in regards uh, to um, a question that says, how do we connect to SmartLink? We currently have a product that allows a connection of digital financial services, hoping that we can provide access uh, to these uh, startups. Yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, the SmartLink program actually is our platform wherein we're trying to link startups with MSMEs as well as with other potential customers, be they in the private sector or with other government agencies. Um, please do, uh, I, I typed uh, in the chat box our website, innovate.dti.gov.ph. Um, where you could find more information about the programs that I discussed in the presentation, including the smart link, uh, of course. And um, you may also uh, communicate with me via, via uh, I have, uh, you may check uh, my page. I have a page in the website about the undersecretary. There is a facility there wherein uh, you could type in your questions or send me an email. Um, so I, I will directly respond to your uh, queries. So please uh, do, do send me an email so we could uh, uh, discuss and try to link you with uh, the MSME network 
work uh, of DTI as well as with uh, the startup uh, community, the community we've been uh, working with. Thank you very much, uh, Yusek. Um, another question that's come through uh, is in regards to um, what technology segments in the Philippines is attracting uh, venture, cap uh, venture capital? And may I direct this question to Anthony, please? Um, I think first and foremost, people are looking at what kind of problems can be solved. Um, so mm -hmm. there are lots of uh, pain points in the Philippines, but the big one is on financial inclusion. So fintech and anything that can help the Filipo Filipinos have access to more affordable loans, more affordable banking is attracting a lot of capital. Then there is the whole e-commerce space at large, not just the e-commerce itself, but anything around communities, purchasing communities, um, uh, e-commerce enablement that is also attracting a lot of capital. And then you have another set of uh, um, topics. Uh, crypto, uh, crypto exchange was having a good momentum until recently. It's a bit shaky at the moment, but Filipinos are also very passionate about crypto and uh, investment in general. Thank you, uh, Anthony. Um, I have a question here, uh, and I think um, uh, Randall will be very uh, well placed to answer it, uh, which is uh, from your perspective, you know, what has been what has been the most significant changes uh, in the Philippines digital ecosystem compared to five years ago? And, and uh, you des described it was a combination of reasons that you know, has brought about this change. How does it compare with other countries in the region? Thank you for that question, Chris. Um, from, from, from where I sit, I think it, it's always been the ability to connect a lot of people through the internet. A lot of uh, companies, uh, mainly the conglomerates, have made enough effort to make sure that everybody gets a connection and, and um, gives the, the individuals the ability to, to be able to use this technology to either connect themselves with other people socially and with creating businesses for, for the betterment of um, their livelihood. So, so doing this, it created a lot of uh, avenues for innovation, uh, and it created a lot of um, you know opportunities for each and everyone in the Philippines. That has promoted um, the, that particular ecosystem compared to other countries significantly in the Philippines. Mm, thank you. That's 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 very interesting. Uh, and I, uh, last question, I think we only have a minute to go. Last question is for Lolos. Uh, just, sorry, um, Jojo. Uh, what do you think is the right recipe for um, international uh, companies to be successful here in, in the Philippines? It's a big question, uh, but uh, if you can answer it in very briefly, that would be great. I think, I think the, the main essence is that the, the more successful foreign-led uh, companies in the Philippines are uh, those that had that that, that operated in the Philippines. I think the first major uh, important aspect that you can uh, have to take a look at is that, you know, are you able to get to the Philippines, stay there, appreciate its culture, the local culture, the ease of doing business, and actually operate here? Uh, I, think, I think that's the most important one. That, the second important recipe is that appreciation, that scale can only happen when you bring this to the base of the pyramid, right? So you, you have everything right now going for the base of the pyramid, before we have a problem because part of the base of the pyramid, they only have feature phones. Now all of them have smartphones and therefore communicating with them is a lot easier this time. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm afraid this is all the time that we have. Um, and uh, I encourage um, our listeners uh, or the audience to reach out uh, to us at Austria. Trade, uh, if you need more information about you know, the Philippines. Uh, so you'll be able to see my and Vanessa Perez's uh, contact details. Vanessa is our investment and business development manager in charge of advanced tech. So thank you very much, everyone, for tuning in. Goodbye for now. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. Oh. Uh, David, Go David, ahead. to you before, uh, before yeah, I wrap up. Yeah, quickly. Yeah, no, th look, thank you, Christopher. And I just wanted to say a very large thank you to uh, all of our speakers, Undersecretary Aldabar, Randall, Anthony, and Jojo. Um, thank you 
Christopher and Vanessa for your support in the Philippines in putting this session together. Um, and also I'd like to thank uh, my team, Marnie and Charlotte and the team at AIIA for all their great support for this webinar. And just quickly mention the next session that's occurring in about a month's time, which is um, going to be a spotlight on Malaysia. Ron, I'll let you have the final word. And uh, someone needs to thank you. So I will do that, David. Yeah. Thank you very much for, uh, for your contribution. Um, it's amazing how much you can pack into 60 minutes. And it was uh, amazing just uh, the, all the, con the content that's there. As David said at the top of the call, uh, the, uh, the session has been recorded and you'll be able to pick this up either at the Austrade site or the AAA site. And we'll send out a link to everyone who's registered. Uh, thank you to all the speakers. Thank you to uh, Austrade. Uh, once again, a magnificent and informative session and we look forward to seeing you at the next one please uh, stay well and stay safe everyone thank you thank you thank you everyone thank you, thank you. Thank you.